The result was that she was everlastingly intruding into the music department. Now, she was unique. I have never in all of my life seen one woman who could throw a whole section of a choir off as successfully and as quickly as she could. She sang in monotones. Choir members tore out their hair, rushed to the choir directors and to the pastor and said, you've got to do something about that woman. Well, as we would try, and she was very gracious about it, she kept saying, but I feel this is where the Lord wants me to be. The point is, the Lord wanted her to be in teaching. That's the gift she was given. She was not content with that. She wanted to be in the other where she could get a little of the limelight. If we ever made the mistake of saying we are short of a piano player, is there anybody here who would volunteer? She was inevitably up at the piano before anybody else even raised their hands and played everything in the key of C. Have you ever tried that? Try singing some of those hymns in the key of C, especially when the left hand is not, no, does not know what the right hand is doing. It makes for a very interesting music program. And we eventually had to say to her, look, God has given you a gift. Let's use it. That's what Paul is saying. They are uniquely given to the individual. His illustration, quite simply, is that if we are eyes, be eyes. If we are ears, be ears. If we are feet, be that. Even if they are encased in leather and smell. But if they are hands, be that. But don't try to be another part of the body. Be the part that God has made you to be. And he closes the chapter. Well, another no other, no other fact. When that is in operation as God intended it to be, there will be no divisions, no contentions. Furthermore, even in the first century, among the first churches, not everybody had all the gifts. They were quite uniquely different and separate. And he asks those rhetorical questions, every one of which has to be answered with a no answer. If, if, I repeat, I am right, then this is what the Corinthians were doing. And Paul is saying, look, there's something better than this. What is better than this is a truly spiritual life. Now he's back to his introduction of chapter 12, verse 1, and he's going to launch into the truly spiritual life in chapter 13, and we'll come back to that tonight. All right, it's time for questions on this material. If you have them, please, fire away. We'll take, we've got exactly uh, 40 minutes. If you wish to use that much time, if you wish to go out and walk, I can't blame you. Yes. I'll be glad to do so. In the book of Ephesians, you have the offices in which the gifts are used. Notice, please. Verse 11. Apostles. The apostle, the apostolic office. Verse 11, Ephesians 4. Prophets. Those who use the gift of prophecy. Evangelists. An evangelist certainly would need the gift of exhortation. He probably could well use the gift of discernment. Knowing how the state of evangelism today, he would desperately need the gift of faith, believe me. See, in other words, many gifts operating within an office, and pastor-teachers, take that word and and put a hyphen in there, because they should be pastor-teachers. Those two things are linked together. Any man who is not teaching his people is not doing his job. Pastor-teacher. Again, you can think of many gifts the pastor-teacher could need. The prophetic ministry, the, uh, the word of God given under the power of the Spirit who wrote it. Again, the gift of faith, the gift of discernment. Sometimes he needs the gift of administration, the gift of ministry. In fact, just keep going. The pastor-teacher needs these things, and I think God gives to some degree, more or less, what they have. Because, now notice, the office is for the perfecting of the saints or the maturing. It's a process, the teleos, the perfecting of the saints. God places men in given offices for the maturation of the body of Christ. He gives to those men certain gifts, and they are to be used within the office where he has them. The listing of the gifts is Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. If you're interested, I'll just read a quick rundown of that list for you. And again, this is open subject to a great deal of controversy, and I don't argue the point. After the rapture, you'll find out. Here are the gifts. Let me just give them to you as, first of all, from the book of Romans. The book gift of prophecy, that's repeated in 1 Corinthians 12. The gift of teaching, that's repeated also, by the way, in 1 Corinthians 12. The gift of exhortation, the ability to come along some, uh, alongside somebody and lift them up. Anybody, anybody had contact with the old Methodists? They used to have the exhorters. Remember that? 
If a man had the gift of exhortation, they made him an exhorter. Now, many times, the exhorters were browbeaters. That isn't what God meant by that. The gift of exhortation was the gift of lifting, lifting people up. Let's take a classic example of the book of Acts, Paul and Barnabas. Remember the first missionary journey of Paul? He and Barnabas went out and they took John Mark, Barnabas', Barnabas young nephew, along with them. There had been a missionary convention in Jerusalem and John Mark had gone forward and dedicated his life and so they took him along on the first missionary journey. Now they got over to Asia Minor and all of a sudden John Mark is looking at men with very, very severe looks on their faces and things are getting real sticky. So one night he packed his bag and went home to Jerusalem. Now Paul never had much to do with people like that. Two years later, he and Barnabas came back. They made the report to the Jerusalem council. They're getting ready to go again. Remember the story? And Barnabas says, pack your bags, Mark, we're leaving. And Paul says, not him. Why not? He failed. That's why. You know, one chance with Paul. That's it. That's all you get. No way are we going to take that kid with us. And Barnabas says, oh, yes, we are. By the way, Barnabas's name meant son of consolation. That was not his original name. That was given to him by the apostles. Isn't that beautiful? you imagine somebody naming you that? The son of consolation. Great, big, shaggy St. Bernard Barnabas. And there's little Dachshund Paul bouncing around saying, he isn't going. And Barnabas says, yes, he is. No, he isn't. Yes, he is. And the Bible says the paroxysm was so sharp between them. You <laughs> think that's unique to our day? They had it then. They had a knockdown, drag out business meeting right on the spot, the two of them. And they departed company. They parted company. Paul took Silas. Barnabas took Mark. Now the Lord takes the wrath of men to praise him. Now we got four evangelists instead of three. And so they go off in opposite direction, do twice as much work. Now, quite frankly, Paul was wrong. How do we know? Because he said so as much himself. Remember when he was in his dungeon in Rome? He said, tell Mark, I want to see him. He's profitable unto me. In fact, if it hadn't been for Barnabas with the gift of exhortation, we might not have had the gospel of Mark. That young man would have been crushed forever. Barnabas took him under his wing. said, look, kid, I know you failed, but you've made it right with the Lord. Two years here in the Jerusalem church, people saying, I thought you were on a mission field. Whatever happened to you? You know, we gave to your support. Why come you aren't out there? He stood that for two years until he finally got out of town with Barnabas again. And Barnabas lifted that boy up. He encouraged him, he exhorted him, and he made him one of the giants of the early church. The gift of exhortation. Don't you need that in your church? People walk up to people, put an arm around their shoulder and say, how's it going, friend? And say it in such a way that somebody knows they've got a kindred soul that they can talk to, share with, pray with, and they just lift them up. Ever had one do that to you? You know, instead of saying, oh, Pastor, you didn't have it this morning, did you? No. Uh, to come by and say, you know, Pastor, we love you. We're praying for you. What can we do to help? I love those people. They are a great gift of exhortation. How'd I get on that? Oh, yeah, they, they get, we're talking. Book of Romans. Let's keep going. The gift of ministry, Romans. Or service is what it means, to serve other people. The gift of giving, again in the book of Romans. The gift of ruling or administration. In Corinthians, it's called governments. Some of them are repeated. The gift of showing mercy with cheerfulness. Now, in Corinthians, you have several duplicated. Prophecy, teaching, but you also have the word of wisdom, and the word of knowledge. You have faith, the gift of faith, 1 Corinthians 12, 9. The gift of discernment, 12, 10. The gift of helps, 12, 28. And the four sign gifts, all in Corinthians, not in Romans. Tongues, interpretation of tongues, the working of miracles, and the gifts of healing. Now, I grant you that's an enticing side road, but we need to have several days just to spend on that. And so please, let's not get too involved in that as of this morning. But... 16 spiritual gifts. Some people have 22, some have 30, some find 12, and so forth. After the rapture, 16 spiritual gifts. We'll find out. Question? Yes. Well, again, we need to do some defining of the gifts. So here we go. <laughs> I had hoped we wouldn't get hung up on that, but let's go anyway. For the one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. The word is Sophia. To another, the word of knowledge, gnosis, the gnosis, by the same spirit. Now, wherever you go through scripture, again, take the same writings, the writings of Paul. Remember, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the what? The word of truth. The gifts 
all revolve around the Word. The gnosis is to know the Word, the supernatural ability given by God to dig truth from the Word. Sophia, wisdom, what to do with the truth you got. I'm sure you've met people who have a great deal of knowledge but have no way in the world of really handling it. To one is given the Sophia, the wisdom to know what to do with it. The other, the gift of... Let me give you an illustration. Had a young man call me up. You know, we have a, a holiday in the United States called May 30th, uh, Memorial Day. On May the 29th, all the Memorial Day that year was on a Monday. On May the 20th, Sunday night, I came home from about five services. I was sitting there, a basket case, and uh, all of a sudden a phone rang. And this voice I did not know said, uh, you Reverend Gardner? I said, yes. He said, uh, young fellow said, I'm pastor so-and-so, and, and I would like to come to talk to you. I said, fine, can you come over this evening? No, he says, I'm 800 miles away. So that was a little difficulty. So I said, well, when do you want to come? He said, could I be there tomorrow on the holidays? I said, how are you going to get here? He says, I'll drive. I'll leave now. The next morning, he was in my driveway when I got up. He had driven all night. Little Volkswagen bug, a road ulcer sitting out there in my driveway. <laughs> and... Uh, he came in, we had breakfast together, we went out in the backyard in the chaise lounges, and there we sat and talked. Now, the conversation went something like this. He said, uh, I said, who are you and where are you? And he told me. He said, I said, what's the problem? He said, I've been in my pastor for two years. And he said, I feel a total failure. And he said, I needed to talk to somebody, and he said, I, I thought you would be the man. So I said, well, let me ask you a couple of questions. Number one, do you like to preach? He said, no, I don't like to preach. It's a bore, it's a drag. He's a pastor and he doesn't like to preach. All right, we got one thing in place. Two, do you like people? He said, no, people bore me too. He said, I just can't stand people. He's in the pastor, he doesn't like to preach, and he doesn't like people. I said, maybe the Lord's trying to tell you something. He said, I know, that's why I'm here. He said, what do you think I ought to do? I said, what do you like to do? He said, I love to study and I love to write. Oh, he said, I would rather read the Old Testament in the Hebrew any day than the English. He said, English is dull. Oh, he said, the Hebrew, it just comes alive. And he said, the New Testament, he said, I love that Greek. Oh, he said, I could just, he said, I wear out my Greek New Testament, my Hebrew Bible. And he said, it just unfolds in front of me. And he said, I love to write. He says, I've got legal pads just full of notes. I said, have you ever stopped to think, young man, that maybe God has given to you the word of knowledge? that you have well, guys like you, men like me, who are running around like chickens with their heads cut off would never have any really material to work with, that some of us dig and some of us speak and we contribute to each other. Well, he said, I've often wondered about that. I said, look, let's pray together about it and let's start pursuing that. Maybe God wants you in that area of the body of Christ rather than where you are. Well, he left that day we had a good time together, and he finally pulled out, and I never heard from him again, which didn't surprise me. He wasn't a well-organized individual, not on that area, anyway. Brilliant, but not well-organized. In fact, we had one in Boston when I was there. He taught at MIT, a mathematical genius. In fact, he was written up in Time magazine. Several of my members were in his classes, working on their doctorates in his classes. And they told him one story of this old boy, Coke bottle glasses, walking across the campus, uh, one of the students who is now a, at the head of one of the departments, one of the Eastern Universities, said to him, good morning, doctor, or good afternoon, doctor, that was it. And he grunted as he went by, totally lost in his mathematics. Went about three steps beyond him and said, young man, young man. He turned around and said, yes, doctor. From which direction did I come? <laughs> he said, sir, you came from that direction. Oh, then in that case, he says, I've had my lunch. And on he went. <laughs> Seriously. Brilliant, brilliant man. Time magazine told of an illustration where a mathematics professor at MIT was working on a com computation on a blackboard that ran the whole length of the blackboard. Can you imagine that? Fifteen feet of computation all down the board, and the whole class was struggling with this, trying to find the answer. They had been working on it for almost an hour. This professor stuck his head in the door, lost again, trying to find out where he was, looking through his glasses, and the professor at the front saw him and said, Oh, doctor, come here, come here, we need you. So he came stumbling into the room, and he said, We can't find the answer to this. Would you copy this down and get us the answer? And so he looked at it, went up the board, went all the way down the kind, said, The answer is, gave it to him, right like that. That's the type of man, but totally unrelated to the world. 
They moved the faculty houses across the Charles River, the other side, tore down the old shacks, the old campus, moved all the faculty over to the brownstones on the other side of the river. At the end of the day, he was lost. <laughs> they found him walking around the old cab trying to find out what happened to my house. You know. <laughs> yeah. Now, there's a man, if you want to compare, who would have the word of knowledge, but not the word of wisdom. He didn't know what to do with it. Well, let me finish my story. My friend disappeared. A few years later, oh, I had heard indirectly through the grapevine that he had gone onto a faculty of a seminary. Now, don't ask me which one, because I'm not about to tell you. No way. You know, you can the rack, the screw, the rubber hose, I'm not going to tell. And um, so uh, I met a student one summer. I was in a conference, and the student came up, introduced himself, and said he was in such and such a school. I said, oh, let me ask you a question. I said, do you have a man on your faculty named so-and-so? And I mentioned this young fellow's name. Oh, yes, he said. Well, I said, how's he doing? Oh, great. Classes are packed. Oh, he said, what a teacher. He said, what he can dig out of the Old Testament is just fantastic. He said, we wouldn't miss his classes. He's a little weird, but oh, is he wonderful in those classes. See, word of knowledge, word of wisdom. The ability to dig the word out, the ability to know what to do with it. Faith, obvious. The ability to trust God above and beyond the unusual, the usual. Paul was a man of faith. Remember he said concerning the Ephesus? He said, I, my, I'm going to Ephesus. And he said, many things await me there. But he said, I'm not a bit disturbed. Paul could always see an open door in a dead-end street, no matter where it was. I personally believe that R.G. Letourneau had the gift of faith. You who know his story. He started off giving 10% to the Lord, ended up living on 10% of his income and giving 90% to the Lord. God can trust some people in that way. They have faith to believe. To another, the gifts of healing. They were one of the sign gifts operating in that day and age, especially among the apostles. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. There's one you could use today. Remember Ananias and Sapphira? Nobody once slipped up to Peter and said, Hey, I got a little word for you about Ananias. Watch him. You know, I was with his accountant, and what he's telling you isn't quite right. No, nobody told him anything. The Holy Spirit discerned that that man's heart was not right, and also Sapphira's. And God dealt very severely with that. On through. In other words, he's simply giving a representative. And notice, please, that most of these gifts that he's talking about are the more glamorous and attention-getting gifts. He's leading up to his illustration that comes further down the line. Long answer to a short question. We've got 25 minutes. Another one? Somebody else had another hand up. Yes. Again, now we're back. We're, <laughs> we're getting into the things I didn't necessarily want to get into because we opened up a whole new can here. But um, actually, of course, as far we'll get. Well, can you wait till we get into chapter 13? Because that will ha partly answer your question right here. I think. Uh, well, again, let's not uh, jump ahead. We'll get into that tonight, if you don't mind. Yes. Another question. Yes. Mm hmm. Well, again, John the Baptist is predicting what was going to happen, which was fulfilled at Pentecost. Since Pentecost, this is the norm, verse 13. And again, it's a simple question of letting the text say what it says. The person who has problems with the text has problems with the text. We can have arguments galore. My argument is no better than yours. But that's why we must always go back and know what the text says and let the text speak for itself. All experiences, all arguments, all illustrations must apply to the text. The text must be sovereign over all of that. Otherwise, we get into this comparison deal. And when, once you start that, there's no end to it. If experience is the base of our theology, then we are in serious trouble for several reasons. One, experiences are often contradictory, supposedly in the same area, and they flatly contradict each other. For instance, some years ago, I used to con direct the Rumney Bible Conference up in New Hampshire. My youngest daughter was just a little girl running around in those days when we had a cottage there on the grounds, and had some very fine memories of that place. 
So I was going back to speak a few years ago, and her husband was going out on a business trip, and so she said, Dad, I'd love to go back with you. I'll help you drive. We could go up. And she says, Jeff's gone, so I'd love to go with you. So we drove up 401, up through here and up into New Hampshire, and we went back to Romney. And one afternoon, so that her education would not be too seriously neglected, I put her in the car and, and took her up a winding macadam road up Stinson Mountain. And we stopped in front of a little white clapboard house with a white picket fence and a little plaque on the front gate. And we sat there in proper reverential awe and looked at the birthplace of Mary pa Baker Patterson Glover Eddy. This is where she was born. We didn't pay the 50 cents to go in because I wasn't about to contribute to it, and I'm too scotch anyway. So we just sat out there and looked at it. The point is this. Mary Baker Eddy had visions and heard voices. Some people have been so unkind as to suggest there were other problems with her, but she had visions and heard voices and brought out Christian science, which, like grape nuts, which is neither grapes nor nuts, is neither Christian nor scientific, but it has swept many thousands of people. By the way, it's now dying. Hallelujah. And uh, it's taken a long time, but it's now, it appears to be on its way out. At the a few years later, a woman out in Missouri named Catherine Kuhlman also had visions and heard voices. But the two of those women produced were totally opposite. Catherine Kuhlman, whatever else you think of her, did preach Christ and did preach the Word of God. And I repeat, you can have all the objections you want with her, but she was at least true to the Scripture in that regard. Mary Baker Eddy was not. But both had identical experiences. Experiences are often contradictory. In addition, many people, having had an experience, later testify to having been deceived. And the minute the argument of deception is allowed, and it must be because it's a fact, then the argument of the basis of experience disintegrates and disappears. Our theology, which in turn will control our, act, our attitudes and our actions, must always be based on what does God say. And that, gentlemen, is why this whole debate about the inerrancy of Scripture is so absolutely vital in the day and age in which we live. There are people saying it doesn't matter. Let's quit fighting about the Bible and all the rest of it. Well, gentlemen, if we don't have an authoritative word, if we don't have something we can trust, if we have something that's suspect in any area, then we have nothing. We are adrift on a subjective swamp. And this guy's ideas are just as good as my ideas, and away we go. We have lost it at that point. I do not feel that that is divisive. If anything is divisive, it is those who question the inerrancy of Scripture, not those who support it. And I am a rock-ribbed, unapologetic, unreconstructed fundamentalist when it comes to that point with no apologies to anybody whatsoever. Without that, we are in trouble. Yes. of this is professed, yes, in the Greek mystery religions. All of this is professed. By the way, interesting enough, it still goes on. The voodooists in Haiti speak ecstatically and do some things that are beyond the explanation, uh, beyond all rational explanation. The witch doctors of Africa, the high priests in Bali, in spiritus seances in our continent, these things happen. They have always been with us. Interesting, isn't it? Peter's address on Acts chapter 2 ascribes to Jesus the signs, wonders, and miracles that attested to his deity. Paul, in writing to the Thessalonians, ascribes exactly the same three words to the Antichrist. The only difference is he puts in one additional word, lying. But the three words are exactly the same. Lying, signs, wonders, and miracles. The devil has always counterfeited down through the years. And so in the mystery religions, the initiate who wished to enter into the fullness of it went through almost exactly the same things as many people do today and received the emotional experience of contact with the gods or goddess on Mount Olympus. And we're able to do supernatural things. At least that's what the historians tell us. All right, the gift of healing, if you want to see it, let's go back to the book of Acts and see it in action. And let's know certain things about it. First of all, let's recognize one fact, it never failed. There was no such thing as a failure. It just simply didn't happen. 
Wherever the gift of healing operated, it operated without failure. It was foolproof, and it authenticated the apostles as the foundation stones of the early church and the early church that God was now bringing into existence, and we're going to come into this in chapter 14, replacing Israel as the people of God for this age. There was no preparation necessary. There was no background involved. Let's look at Acts chapter 3, and here's the gift of healing in operation in the apostolic days, exactly as it happened. Interesting story. Now, Peter and John, notice two apostles, went up together where? to the temple, the center of Jewish life and worship, when at the hour of prayer, when the maximum number would be there, being the ninth hour, now here's our man, verse 2, and a certain man lame from his mother's womb, notice not a word is said about him being a believer, he's there for one reason, to ask alms. He has not been to a preparation meeting, he doesn't have a little white card in his hand, Nobody's bringing him through the line. The Hammond organ isn't throbbing. The great physician now is near in the background. Nobody is saying, turn your faith loose. Something good is going to happen to you today. No, he's sitting there looking for money. That's all he wants is money. He has not the foggiest notion of anything else. All right, Peter and John, come on. Verse 3, who seen Peter and John about to go into heaven, asked an alms. That's all he wanted. And Peter fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. Right now his hopes are raised. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. Now right there they depressed his Dow Jones for the day, because that's why he's there. He's there for money. That's all he's there for. And they say, We don't have any. So the response is, You know, move on, Clods, and let somebody come along that has a few drachmas. This is what he's there for. It's the way he makes his living. But such as I have, give I thee. Notice, no preparation on the part of the recipient whatsoever. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, let me paraphrase verse 7, doing no damage whatsoever to the original, but just to bring it a little clearer. And Peter took him by the right hand and lifted him up in the air. Now, let's remember something. This man has never walked. Do you remember how long it took your kids to learn to walk? Boy, mine were retarded. We had a terrible time trying to get those kids to walk. They ran into coffee tables. They stumbled over pianos. It was wild. It took a long time. And it was a painful process. This man is now an adult and has never walked. Remember that. And here is this big fisherman, Peter, holding him in midair. Now, you know what's going through the guy's head. You know, when this yo-yo lets me go, it's splot on the temple floor. He's not expecting healing. He wanted money. All right. In midair, immediately, verse 7, after Peter lifted him up, his feet and ankle bones received strength. No preparation, no expectation, no prayer time. The gift uh, operated automatically, authenticating these men in front of the Jewish nation, as we'll see when we come to chapter 14. And there was the gift. It never failed. They never said to him, you don't have any faith. Go home and read a few more books or go to a seminar. No. It always worked. And there, my friend, quite simply, if that gift is still in operation, I've got a very simple proposition. I've made it all across America. It's this. If that gift is still operating, then there's a very simple way to prove it. Number one, go where the sick people are. That's what Peter and John did. They did not bring the man to him, to them. They went where he was. Now, where are the sick people? They're in the hospitals. So go where the sick people are and say to them, Acromycin and penicillin have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Pick them up, Johnny Gown and all, and in midair they get well. It's not a ridiculous illustration. It's perfectly logical in the light of what the book of Acts pictures for us. And I suggest we could clean out most hospitals in the morning, start on the rest in the afternoon, we'd have everybody home well. If it's the same thing. The point simply is that not everybody got healed in the book of Acts. Remember Paul leaving his best friend Trophimus behind at Miletus sick? In his early ministry, he had great miracles. But as the church became authenticated, as God's stamp became recognized, the supernatural, the sign gifts, began to fade away because they were no longer necessary. And so Paul does not heal his own friend. He leaves him behind. Did Paul lack faith? No. Did Trophimus lack faith? No. There's no such even inference of that in the passage. Just simply... Here was the way the gift of. Now somebody says, then you say God is near. Oh, no. I stand here as a great testimony to the healing power of God. I would not be alive if it were not for the prayers of God's people. 
The mark, quite simply, friend, today is in the book of James. James 5. Right. Some people would like to get rid of that book. Say, that's not for our day. But, friend, I love, I notice they love the other things in the book. They just don't like the last part. You can't pick and choose, friend. Now, notice what he says. Is any among you afflicted? That's basically a mental disturbance. In other words, if you've got emotional problems, let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Of course he is. He's going to rejoice. Is any sick? Now we're down to the physical. Is any sick among you? Let him call. Notice who does the calling? The sick person. Not somebody outside. The sick people do the calling. Who do they call? The elders, plural. The responsible people, spiritual people in the local assembly. The elders. And notice the plurality here. Not elder. Singular. Nobody's going to get the credit here but God. And let them, the elders, pray over him, anointing him with oil, always throughout the word of God, a sign and symbol of the Holy Spirit, in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of the faith, a prayer prayed within the context of the will of God, shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise them up. Notice the next line, if you've committed sins. Repentance is involved here as well. They shall be forgiven here. Now, right simply, gentlemen, there's the routine. The sick in our churches have a right to call for us to pray for them. We pray within the context of the will of God for that individual. And then, gentlemen, we leave the final results with the Lord. They're his. Illustrated, one Sunday morning at the close of my service in a previous pastorate, two ladies and their husbands were waiting for us. After everybody had gone, they came to me and said, with the pastors and the deacons, well, in that place we had a deacon a deacon board instead of an elder board and they said would you the pastors and the deacons be willing to pray for us to make the long story short both women that week had been diagnosed as having terminal cancer cancer of the liver any of you know anything about know that there is no hope for that there is no way out that is terminal the two women let me describe them to you the one was bonnie i'll not give you the last name obviously bonnie was a delight she was a pastor's joy every time the door was open she was there always with a smile on her face, praying for people, leading people to Christ, supportive, just a delightful individual, delightful individual, beautiful family. The other woman, whose name I will not even give you her first name, was just the opposite. She was a problem woman, she was a troublemaker, she was a gossip, she always controversy, always swirled around her, wherever she was. They knelt together, and the deacons and the pastors prayed one prayer. Mark what I'm saying now. One prayer for both women. Dear God, here are these, your children. Temples of the Holy Spirit. You have a vested interest in these bodies. Now, Lord, you know the condition. We're asking you now, within the framework of your perfect will for these lives, to touch and to heal these women. We leave it with you, Lord. Whatever you do, we will say is best. But we are asking this for them. To give you an idea how much the second woman's faith, how much faith she had, she left the next day for California to say goodbye to her family. We prayed for her on Sunday. She leaves to say goodbye on Monday. So you can see how much faith was operating there. Bonnie went back to work as a hairdresser. Three months later, I had my vacation, month of August. I spent the last Sunday night of my vacation sitting in a hospital room. Bonnie's husband on this side of the bed, me on this side of the bed, holding each of her hands. And she struggled in a coma to try to hold on to life. And finally, at about 9.30 at night, she died. And the two of us, the two men, we buried our face in the cover of that bed and wept. Bill, for a wife whom he loved so deeply, and had given him such a wonderful life together, and me, for a member, I could not afford to lose. She was my friend, my wife's friend. Wednesday was her funeral. The church was packed. I never saw so many people coming by and saying, this woman prayed for me. This woman led me to the Lord. This woman came to my house when I needed something. Delightful. Rejoicing service. You know, one of those funeral services where there's a lot of tears, but it comes out from joy. Just sheer joy. The congregation sang, How Great Thou Art. Oh, I'll never forget it. Organ, full blast. That congregation singing. It almost rocked the casket. It was delightful. You know. As I went in to get ready for that service, my desk, my secretary had piled the mail up. I came in early to take care of some correspondence and get ready for it. On top of the pile was a little square envelope, and I opened it, perfume came out of it. And the envelope said this, Dear Pastor, I think you'll be happy to know 
that I have just returned from the University of California clinic, cancer clinic at Long Beach, and the doctors have told me that my cancer is in complete remission. They cannot find a trace of it. Now, of course, you know, doctors never say you're healed. It's just in remission. But they couldn't find a trace of it in that woman's body. You know which one she was. And that arrived on the day of Bonnie's funeral. I read it to the congregation. I said, three months ago, we prayed for both of these women. Today, we bury Bonnie. And today, this woman is coming home to us perfectly well. Same prayer, same people, same moment. God's will was involved. When I left the cemetery, I'll, be quite, I'll confess to you quite candidly, I had a real argument with God. I mean, the Lord really heard from me that day. Believe me, you know. Lord, how could you do this to me? Of the two women, how could you give me that one and take this one? And my wife, with her wisdom, oh, bless our wives, she looked at me and said, Honey, have you ever stopped to think that Bonnie was ready? The Lord's got a lot more work to do on her. I can't fault that argument. <laughs> Absolutely true. Same prayer. Yes, gentlemen, we have a right to pray for our people, and we ought to. In fact, we ought to beat the doctor to it. But it is a prayer prayed within the context of the will of God. The gift in apostolic days did not fail, required no preparation, and the people didn't even have to be believers to receive it. It was done publicly before the crowd, the multitude, particularly the Israelites, authenticating those apostles and that early church and was totally different than what passes for it in this day and age. You asked that question, did you? I get going on and on, forget who asked the question. We've got exactly five minutes. Yes, sir. Could you make the same comparison between the song? Yes, I will, if you will be willing to wait. Tonight. Tonight or tomorrow morning? Both. Yes. <sighs> Sorry. exactly the same and for a very good reason they weren't exactly the same and Paul's whole argument from prophecy falls apart uh, we'll deal with 14 tomorrow but we'll also be touching on it tonight yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah well that again the argument the, the gentleman's question problem is that people often say, well, that's your interpretation. Friend, when it says it, it says it. Let's have the honesty to say what well, the Bible says what it says. It's as simple as that. This, th that's a, that's a, a cop-out, the idea that that's your interpretation. If it says it, it says it. I was speaking at University of uh, Ohio, I'm at uh, Oxford, Ohio, Miami University, InterVarsity. I do a lot of work for InterVarsity. InterVarsity had me in one night. If you've ever been on this InterVarsity thing, you know what I'm talking about. They give you 20 minutes to speak. They hand you your type, your topic, and everybody's there. You know, Jew, Gentile, Protestant, Catholic, Atheist, Buddhist, everybody's there. It's a, it's a secular university. And they handed me the title, Is Christianity Unique? And gave me 20 minutes to develop it with this crowd, then throw it open for questions. And that's when it gets interesting, because anybody's free to pop up and say anything they want. Well, as we were doing this in this auditorium, packed hundreds of students, I noticed one particular one. My attention drifted back to him. He had come in a little late and was sitting in the rear. Now, let me describe him for you. He had long, dirty, stringy hair. I have no big hang-up on long hair, but this one was dirty. It had not seen soap and water for a long time. He had on a T-shirt with a Stroh's beer commercial on the front of it, torn blue jeans, dirty feet in sandals. There he was sitting in the back, and I thought, you know, buddy... I don't know how they put up with you. Uh, somebody in the student body ought to get you either cleaned up or out of here. One, you're contagious. And he, there, he had not very little to say. As I was leaving, he was waiting for me. And I thought, oh, boy, you know, what have I got now? So he came up to me, extended his hand, introduced himself as Dr. So-and-so, and I suddenly realized I was not speaking to a student, I was speaking to the faculty. And he suggested that we go over to the bachelor quarters and wrap for a while. Fine, let's go. So we went over to his digs, as he called it. Now that was one of the best named places I've ever seen. <laughs> so. I have been in coal mines that look better than that, Tim. 
clothes all over the place, food on the floor. We sat in two bean bags, and we were going to wrap. Well, he started in. He was a professor of philosophy. He started in spinning out this philosophy. So I had my little testament with me, and I stopped him, and I said, but the word of God says, and immediately he says, oh, wait a minute. We're not going to talk about the Bible. And I said, why not? Well, he said, because. He said, what you would say is just uh, your interpretation of what it says. I said, sir, you invited me over here to rap. Yes. I said, I've been here a full 35 minutes, and I haven't seen one present. No, no paper, no seals, no ties, no nothing. When are we going to start to rap? Oh, he says, that isn't what I meant. Well, I said, that's my interpretation of what you meant. No, no, he said. You know better than that, Mr. Gardner. He said, what I meant, I meant. Well, I said, why can't you have the honesty to just let the writers of Scripture do the same thing? If they say it, they say it. And instead of ducking the issue and saying that's your interpretation, why don't you just let them say it? Well, he says, you put it like that. I said, that's exactly the way I put it if we're going to continue this conversation. And so at that point, we stopped that little old subterfuge right on, the, right on its nose. But that is the way people get around what the Bible says. That's your interpretation. No, if that's what it says, it says it. Now, if you're dealing with interpretation, as I did with verse 31, then have the honesty to say to your people, this is my interpretation, because that's what it is. Otherwise, if it's a clear statement, let it be a clear statement. I may not know the explanation for it, but that's what it says. And that's where it must stand. One minute. Who's got a one-minute question? It's going to take you that long to say it. Yes. Yes. All right. If you anticipate any psychologist will tell you. If you anticipate and are surrounded by the proper peer group, given the proper subtle pressures, subtle or over, it makes no difference, what you anticipate is going to happen to you. We are all subject to our environment. Let's face it, no matter who we are. I went to an A.A. A. Allen revival meeting one night to observe. You all remember A.A. A. Allen? He died with delirium treatments in a San Francisco hotel room. Um, I had been there through six offerings and, and a lot of singing, and finally he came out in his pistachio suit and so forth. But the thing that got me was this. Here I was sitting there to observe. We were singing, clapping, stamping feet, dancing in the aisles, and the first thing I noticed was that my foot was going up and down on the floor. I was subject to the environment in which I was in. Quite frankly, I left the meeting because I am not going to allow myself to be taken over. It's as simple as that. And when people anticipate because others have seen them do it, and it has long been a custom, it's nowhere in Scripture, not a line in the New Testament, then it's going to happen, especially to those who anticipate the most.